All right, let's make welcome the two funniest words in Christian comedy, Mike Warnke. I have been noticing some movement. And I would appreciate it if everyone would keep their seats until I am finished. This is especially important in regards to the bathroom. I do not want anyone to go to the bathroom while I am preaching because I have to go too. And there's no way for me to leave and as long as I've got to stand up here and suffer through all of this, I don't see why you can't suffer with me, okay? We can offer it up to the Lord as some sort of sacrifice, all right? Oh God, take this pain. I mean, you know, I mean, it's okay. The Bible says we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, you know what I mean? And don't try and walk out of here and tell me that you're going to go call your mama because nobody walks like that to a phone, you know? I mean, it, it ain't so bad watching you walk out, but when you come back in all smiles, I hate that, all right now? See, I hate that. And don't want you sisters to start going potty because you guys don't go one at a time, all right? It's a, it's a herd instinct with you guys, okay? We're talking, you know. You, no, now, listen. You guys, I tell you, you guys start going to the bathroom, it's like a move of God in the body of Christ, you know. But, I, you, know, you know, I'm telling you the truth about the sisters, you know. Because, like, I mean, after this is over tonight, some of you guys are going to go and, and find a place to go pig out. See, but you won't call it pig out because Christians have their own language. We have terms to describe everything that we do so as to impress people with our spirituality by using terms that turn even our everyday activities into spiritual activities. So after the concert, nobody's going to walk up to anybody else and say, Hey, let's go pig out. <laughs> You're going to say, How about a little fellowship? <laughs> yeah, you will. And, and, and... And when you're out there fellowshipping, you're going to want to really gossip. But, you know, Christians, the Christians don't gossip, they share. And, uh, and if you want to get real nasty about it, you share in love. You know, I always get worried. I always get worried when somebody comes up to me and says, I want to tell you this in love, you know. Because I figure if the next thing somebody's going to do to me is love me, they don't have to tell me. Because when they do it, I'll know that they did it. And when they don't do it, I'll know that they didn't too, you know. So you ought to be out there fellowshipping and sharing maybe nine couples around a table and all of a sudden one of the sisters, she'll stand up and say, who's got to go? And they'll all, <laughs> and they'll go. Whatever. And then, and then it'll take them 45 minutes to come back. And, and one of you brothers, when they get back, one of you brothers will say, oh, what took you so long? And the sisters will say, there was a line. Of course there was a line. You took it with you. <laughs> and them sisters, you know, they all start out from the table, friends leave, but you know, as they get closer to the bathroom, they start jockeying for position, you know? <laughs> it's like pole position at Daytona, you know what I mean? I mean, it's terrible, you know? And what I got to figure out one of these days is what takes so many of you sisters in there to do. Because it don't take that many of us brothers, I'll tell you that right now. You know what would happen to me if I stood up at the table and said, how many brothers got to go? <laughs> huh? Anyhow. Now, there's two groups of people that are not bound by the no potty clause. The first of these groups is pregnant women. Because pregnant women are not in charge of when they go to the bathroom. Because there's somebody else in there hanging on their ribcage saying, we got to go now. <laughs> You never want to get between a pregnant woman and a bathroom door. Because I don't care if the sister's saved, she'll hurt you in Jesus' name. 
She'd be saying, I'll pray for you in a minute. You know what I'm And little bitty kids, I'm not talking about 13-year-olds that are trying to find a place to smoke dope. I'm talking about little bitty kids, you know, counting as big as <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> At that point, you got a little time. If they start pulling on any of your clothes, things are getting more serious. I got to go to the bathroom, you know. If they start going, I got to go to the bathroom, take them right then because you're only minutes from disaster, see? Because the next step in that parade is, I told you I had to go to the bathroom. You know, and see, see, you'll ignore them till they make a mistake and then when they do, you'll punish them. And you know, moms and dads punish kids different. Like if your mama beats you, She's going to talk to you the whole time she's giving you the whipping. You know what I'm saying? She'll be saying, I thought I told you not to do that. What do you mean by disobeying me, young man? Do you understand me? Yes, ma'am. Don't you talk back to me, you know? And, and, the, whole, and the whole time, and the whole time this is going on, see, you're going, ah, ah. And your father, see, your father has a whole different approach. He comes in, he says, I'm going to kill you now. Go out and wait in the yard, because I don't want to get blood on Mama's floor, all right? <laughs> so I, I got... I got a bunch of kids of my own. I got six. And I got a 21-year-old daughter who is adopted. Then I got a 20-year-old daughter. Then I got a... 18-year-old daughter, then I got a 15-year-old son, I got a 13-year-old, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, she's in there somewhere. And uh, you got a 10-year-old son. And they all grew up to be preppies. And that was nice because I didn't want them to grow up to be like me because I didn't want to put up with a teenager like I was, you know what I'm saying? And I figured out early what I would do was I'd just stay weird knowing that they would eventually rebel against me. <laughs> you know, and they did. And... Uh, They yell at me, turn down your stereo, you know. <laughs> I'm, the only, I'm the only parent in our block that gets grounded, you know. <laughs> a 13-year-old, I said that she grew up to be a preppy, but she really didn't. She grew up to be a valley girl. Yeah, and I don't know how that happened exactly, but one day I was packing stuff in my bedroom, getting ready to go on a trip, and she was out in the hallway outside the bedroom door talking to a little friend of hers, telling that little friend about Jesus. And so I was listening at the door, exercising my parental prerogative and eavesdropping. <laughs> and I was listening to her talk, and she says to her friend, Lake, at your house, are you guys, Lake, saved or what? <laughs> and the little girl said, gee, I don't know, what's that mean? And Catherine said, well, Lake, have you uh, accepted Jesus as your, Lake, personal savior or Lake what? And the little girl said, well, gee, I don't think so. What does that mean? I don't think we've done that. And Catherine said, oh, wow, bump me out. That means you guys are going to like hell. <laughs> and the little girl said, well, gee, we don't want to do that. How do we keep from doing that? And Catherine says, well, you've got to get into the like Bible, okay, and find out what it is God wants for your life, you know. And then you get hip to that and everything like that, and you become like obedient, and then God like blesses you and everything is cool, all right? And the little girl says, yeah, sounds kind of tubular, you know, and uh, <laughs> she's the only thing is, she says, I'm kind of scared of the Bible, isn't it kind of a scary book? Catherine said, no, it's full of all kinds of really nifty stories, okay? It's like the first story, it's like this totally gnarly dude and this really tough chick living in this totally awesome garden, all right? <laughs> and they're hanging out in there, you know, and God tells them that they can scarf from like any tree in the place, all right? Except like for this one, and if they scar from it, it will bum him out to the max, all right? <laughs> so everything, everything is going cool until one day the chick is like cruising the garden, all right? And what should she see her feet but like a totally grody snake? <laughs> I mean, gag me with an entire place setting, right? And the snake said, ooh, babe, have I got some fruit for you, <laughs> you know? And she says, no, we can't scar from that tree because if we do, it will really bum God out. And the snake said, no, God's just jealous because he knows if you scar from that tree, it will make you as hip as him. 
Okay, she was a total disbrain, and being the disbrain that she was, she took some of this fruit back to her old man, and they both scarf from it, and now they become aware that they are like totally naked. I mean, put me on a roller coaster and watch me throw up, right? <laughs> now they're running all over the garden trying to find some like designer fig leaves, you know? <laughs> and all they can find is this totally gross Kmart stuff, you know? And sure enough, God shows up and he is really bummed with them. And he says, oh, okay, you two are history in this place. And he kicks them right out in the street. They're walking down the road and Adam turns to Eve and says, well, you got to save yourself, chick. And she said, hey, dude, stuff happens. He said, yeah, I know, but you just ate us out of house and home, okay? <laughs> because they've always wanted to be involved in what I was doing. I remember when I lost weight. <laughs> now, just wait a minute. I used to weigh 310 pounds, folks. I mean, you may think I got a spare tire now, but honey, it's a Honda tire now. It used to be a Michelin Radio X, all right? <laughs> and when I started losing weight, I really didn't know how to do it. So I went to my cousin, Harry, who had lost a lot of weight, and I asked him how to do it. And I said, hey, man, Harry, how'd you lose your weight? Harry said, I got this can of magic diet powder. All you have to do is take it home, put it into the blender with a few ice cubes, whip it into a frothy milk-like substance, and then you take it and sip it down, and I guarantee it will help you take arms against the sea of adipose tissue that is collected upon your personal being. <laughs> and I was thrilled, so I took a can of the magic powder, and I went home. I went into the kitchen, got the blender out, and called all the kids into the kitchen because the kids like to watch me do stuff, see? And I said, hey, guess what? I'm going to lose weight. And my 13-year-old said, like, right now? I said, no, it may take me a minute, okay? And she said, well, hey, let me go get the dog, okay? Dog is 14 years old, right? That's 98 or something to you and me. The dog's got arthritis in all four legs, got no teeth. I mean, a dog doesn't even chase people anymore. She just sits on the front porch and says, stranger in the yard. <laughs> At least I don't know him. <laughs> yeah. And if she did bark, what would, it, I mean, how, what would it accomplish if she did bark? What would a dog with no teeth sound like when she barked? Woof. <laughs> would that scare you? Woof. You climbing in my house, you coming through the window to burglarize my possession, and you hear woof. Does that make you want to run away? No, that makes you want to go. So they got the dog in there, man, and I got my magic powder, you know, and I put it into the blender and put the ice cubes in there and turned that sucker on. <laughs> turned it right off again because I didn't put the little lid on, you know. And it shot that stuff all over the kitchen. You should have seen them ice cubes. They was like bullets in a war. And the dog, man, is up running around the table going, woof, woof. And the kids are going, get some dad, get some dad, get some dad. All except the 10 year olds, me saying, wait until mama sees this. So I got everything turned off, put some more diet powder in there, put some more ice cubes in there, put the lid on, and boy, when I got ready to do it the next time, man, I didn't fool around. You know, I didn't punch, chop, or puree, or whip. I went right to liquefy, man. <laughs> We're talking heavy-duty blending, because you push them other buttons and you get nee, nee, nee. You hit liquefy, you get ah! <laughs> We're talking serious blending here, all right? And I had to blend ah! Woof, 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 get some dad, get some dad. Wait until mama sees this. You know? And finally, I got it whipped up into the consistency it was supposed to be. I turned the thing off, took the lid off, the thing that puts into the blender thing, and I reached into the cupboard, got out a glass, poured some of the milkshake-like substance into the glass, put it up to my throat, and sucked the big suck, and my throat said, not in here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It was the nastiest stuff I ever tasted in my life. My taste buds had little shovels. They were saying, get that out of here. 
You don't know where that's been. That tastes like what you put on plants, you know. <laughs> Said it didn't work, so I decided what I needed to do to lose weight was to jog. And I went out and watched everybody else jog, and they all had jogging suits. They had red jogging suits and purple jogging suits and, 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 and blue jogging suits and chartreuse jogging suits and orange jogging suits. I had to have my jogging suit made at the Tent and Awning Company, so I had a green and white striped jogging suit. You know? I looked like a watermelon with a head. <laughs> Embarrassing. And the first morning I went jogging with the boys, I found out I had another problem, too, because all the extra 120 pounds that I had on my frame was sticking right out in front of me. And when I'd get my stride up, my belly'd start jumping up and hit me in the face. <laughs> I'd be running down the street saying, jip a boom jip a boom jip a boom <laughs> I lost a lot of weight in my face. Because <laughs> my belly beat my jaws off, you know? <laughs> One morning the ultimate happened. I was running down the road, jip a boom jip a boom jip a boom then all of a sudden, my sweatshirt slipped up and my bare belly hit me right in the face. <laughs> and my navel made suction on my forehead and I nearly smothered to death before I could get that. Ah! It was terrible. And when I did pull it back down, left a big hickey right in the middle of my forehead. I looked like a bruised Hindu. I got home after the most traumatic experience of my life, walked in the door, Rose took one look at me and said, where you been? I said, I've been jogging. She said, with who, Jaws? It's, it's very interesting how people seem to get committed to the wrong things sometimes. I mean, I never really lost any weight until I became aware that I wasn't trying to lose weight to justify the system. I wasn't trying to lose weight so that everybody would really think well of me. I was losing weight because the doctor told me if I didn't lose some, I was going to die. And so I started losing weight, but you know, the thing about it was, there in the beginning, I didn't lose anything. I was just so busy trying to keep up with all of the rules and regulations of dieting I was so busy trying to outdo everybody else that was doing the same kind of diet plan that I was doing, I really never had any time to lose any weight. I didn't start losing weight until I sat down and realized that what I was doing was something I needed to do for myself. And I didn't, I didn't start losing until I sat down and started to realize that the only plan that was going to work for me was the plan that was good for me. Not the plan that was good for the other guys that were doing Cambridge and not the plan that was good for the other guys that were jocking and not the plan that was good for the other guys in Weight Watchers, but the guys, you know, they had their plan and I needed one for me. See, I needed one that was going to work for me because I'm an individual. I don't come in bunches like grapes. I don't come in bunches like bananas. I don't come in sacks like oranges. I'm just Mike. And what's good for you may not be good for me. And what will help you may not help me. And what may help me may not help you. But the thing that we all have to do is sit down someplace and figure out what's best for us and then do that. See? And the only reason I'm telling you this is because I think there are a lot of people that run their Christianity the same way I ran my diet. They're so involved with the rules and regulations of religion they're so busy trying to outdo the other Baptists or outdo the other Methodists or outdo the other Presbyterians or outdo the other Catholics that none of them got time to be a Christian. You know? I started gaining on my weight problem when I became aware that as an individual I deserved an individual response to my problem. And the Bible says that each of us works out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't mean that we don't all have to accept Jesus, but we don't all have to belong to the second St. Luke overcoming Pentecostal Church of God in Christ with signs and fires following after we do that. Because God may not want us to belong there. He may want us to belong to somebody else. All of us don't have to do the same things. All of us don't have to believe the same things. All of us don't have to walk the same walk. All of us don't have to, to, to talk the same talk. All we've got to do is share the same Jesus, and then we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And instead...
And instead of spending so much time ragging on each other because so-and-so doesn't fit in or so-and-so doesn't measure up or spending so much time running around guilty because you don't measure up and so-and-so's ragging on you, if we would all just allow each other to do as God is leading each of us to do and lend a hand when we can and receive help when we need to, then I think Christianity would be a lot more appealing thing for a whole lot of people who are trying to find Jesus in the world today. You see, I don't think that Christianity is something that you talk about. I think Christianity is something that you do. And the people out there that need to know about Jesus aren't listening to hear about him. They're looking to see him. And the only people that can show him are people that have him in their heart and start acting like him. You've got to start being committed to the concepts of Christ instead of the rules and regulations of religion if you're really going to show people Jesus. If you're going to be committed to the rules and regulations and you're going to live that, then you can show people your denomination. You can show them your particular slant on things. You can show them your church building, your carpet, your pews, your hymn books. But you see, none of that stuff is going to get any of those people to heaven. None of that stuff is ever going to give them the answer that they need. Because when you're looking for Jesus, there's only one thing that's satisfied, and that's Jesus. And if they're looking and they don't see him in you, then where are they going to look? You see, the thing about being all hung up on the rules and regulations, it makes your witness so negative. You know what I mean? Instead of telling people about the things they get to do as Christians, you spend all your time telling them about the stuff they can't do, you know? I have been married to this husband of mine for 45 years, and all of those years I have been trying to make him go to church with me, but instead he sits at home and drinks beer and watches them football games, and every Sunday after church, after me and kids go to the cafeteria, our preacher lets us out 15 minutes early so we can beat the Methodists. After we go to the cafeteria, I get home and walk in and kick that beer out of his hand, slap him across the face, turn off that TV set and says, God loves you, you filthy, no good, low down heathen. I just don't understand why he hadn't accepted Jesus yet. You know the kind of Christians I'm talking about? Hey, you can tell I'm saved. I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't dance and I don't go to movies and I don't watch TV and I don't read books and I don't read newspapers and I don't tell jokes and I wear my shirt buttoned up to the top and I don't I ever none unbutton it and, and I don't wear my hair long and bless God, if you get saved, you can have all the fun I'm having. Won't you be blessed, you know? <laughs> People be saying, whoa, you know? See, I know about this because, see, I get to kids after you guys get done with them. See, they come to me because I make them laugh. Now, I remember one night a, a lady brought a kid, sat in the third row back, and there wasn't any middle aisle. They sat right in the middle, third row back there, Al. And I mean, this kid was stone. And I don't mean he had a pleasant buzz on. I mean, this kid was gutter crawling, uh, tongue dragging, commode hugging stone. I mean, the kid was stone, you know. And I could tell he was stoned because he kept getting happy in the wrong places. You know? <laughs> and he kept getting sad in the wrong places. And he was also nodding off. And it was strange because he was sitting with his mama, you know, and every time he'd nod off, she'd elbow him. And you know, mama's got them stiletto elbows, you know. <laughs> I mean, your grandma elbow you, you ain't in too big a trouble. But boy, I tell you, mama take a shot at you and you ain't in big trouble, all right? Cause she get past your arm, through your clothes, between your ribs, across your chest, and out the other side. She say, "Ha!" And you go, oh, "I'm awake! I'm awake! I can't breathe, and I'm gonna die. But I'm gonna do it with my eyes open, okay?" You know. And this kid would nod off, and his mama would give him the elbow. And he was so stoned, he wouldn't remember it. it was his mother. And every time she'd elbow him, he'd go, "Oh, lady, don't do that to me!" Do you know how hard it is to preach when you got a freak flipping out about every 15 minutes? I mean, I'd be up there and I'd say, God said, Oh, lady, don't do that to me! You ought to try and find a scripture reference for that one. And like I said, he kept getting happy in the wrong places. I was talking about how my mom died when I was eight and my dad died when I was 11. I was telling about my terrible childhood and this kid's going. <laughs> 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 I 
couldn't have a normal laugh, you know. You, <laughs> you know, it kills me. People that do drugs think that it makes them look so cool. <laughs> I mean, why do you think they call it dope? Dope. And then I was telling him about one time when this friend of mine, this was before I got saved, and this friend of mine and I was smoking some dope one day and we got the munchies bad, okay? Now I realize that straight people don't get the munchies. Straight people get hungry. <laughs> and when straight people get hungry, they say, wow, why don't you grab our 2.5 kids, Marge, and throw them in the back of the old station wagon with a collie, and I'll run inside and put on my white leisure suit and my white buck shoes and put a little butch wax on the crew cut, and we'll run down to the Golden Arches and satiate the old appetite. Well, I'll tell you, we'll have a family out and milkshakes and everything, you know? And they do their little suburban deal, see? Now, freaks are different. Freaks don't even get up until 11.30. And then they start smoking or snorting or drinking or shooting or popping, whatever it is that they're trying to abuse into their system. About 4.30 in the afternoon, their bodies realize that they have not had food. And the uncontrollable hungries, the mad munchies, the unbeatable, the unbearable, you have got to eat right now hungries, jump out from behind the furniture and everything and grab them up in their faces and say, you've got to eat now. Don't ever walk up to a freak with the munchies because he will eat anything you present, okay? he look at you and say, wow, buttons. <laughs> you know, and you'd be going, oh, no, you know, and it's terrible. Well, me and this friend of mine, we was munched out to the max, and we wanted a chocolate cream pie. We lived in California, and there's a store out in California where they make homemade pies. It's called Marie Callender's, and they have, a, they have a pie that's about, oh, I'd say it's about eight inches across, and it's about five or six inches deep. It's a mountain of sin on a plate. <laughs> has on the side of the pan, warning, the Surgeon General has determined that if you eat this, you'll get fat as a pig. <laughs> but we wanted a chocolate cream pie. So we went down to Marie Callender's and we bought one. And then we went back out into the parking lot and got on the motorcycle to go home. <laughs> and I was sitting in back of the brother, see? And I had my arm around his waist and I had the pie in my other hand tilted just so that the wind would push it into my palm and keep it there so I wouldn't lose track of it. We pulled out into traffic, began to go along. We increased our speed until we were doing about 60 miles an hour. And the pie was cool and the sun was shining and the birds were singing and our hair was flowing in the breeze and everything was going just fine until we came to the left turn. <laughs> but it was one of them wide, double lane, high arcing left turns. And the guy next to us was in a Volkswagen with his window open. About the time we got to the top high bank of that left turn, the wind said, to my pie. It flew out of my hand and flew into that man's window and hit him in the head going 120 miles an hour. <laughs> pie didn't say, it said. <laughs> and it goes back and say, <laughs> And I'm telling this story and the freak's sitting out there going, aww. And after the concert was over, they, pour, they, they drugged this poor unfortunate out in the narthex to talk to me. And they propped him up against the table, because if they hadn't, if he'd have fallen on his face. And he looked at me, and there's about 500 Christians milling around out there, you know, fellowshipping and sharing. Because, but if you don't do it at a restaurant, you call it afterglow. <laughs> and so they're out there after, afterglowing. And a boy's hanging on the edge of the record table trying to talk to me. He said, Brother Mike. Brother Mike. Brother, brother, brother Mike. I said, hey, you got it right three times. He said, I need, I need to ask you a question. That's okay, what is it? He said, do I have to quit smoking dope to accept Jesus? <laughs> and all 500 of them Christians said, 
Because, you know, when the Lord talks, even E.F. Hutton listens, you know. <laughs> he said, do I have to quit smoking dope to accept Jesus? I said, no. All 500 of them Christians said, <gasps> They created such suction that there was a kid going by the front of the church on a bicycle, <laughs> delivering papers that sucked him right into the narthex. <laughs> you know? He's sitting in there on his bicycle saying, Paper? And the kid said, You don't understand. You don't understand. I mean, do I have a quit smoking marijuana? to accept Jesus. I said, no. He said, you, you don't understand. <laughs> he said, I mean, do I have to quit smoking this? Reached inside his coat and pulled out the biggest joint you ever saw in your life. I mean, this doobie, he had to have rolled this thing in a paper towel tube, okay? You know, because it, it was a foot long and about three inches in diameter, you know. And he was waving it under my nose. Do you want me to quit smoking? This? And I haven't been saved that long. I'm going, I rebuke this. And, and, and. and he's waving it under my nose. I said, do I have to quit smoking this in order to accept Jesus? I said, read my lips. No. He said, I, I don't think I understand. I said, well, well, let me explain it to you this way, okay? Do you have to get cleaned up to take a bath? He said, no. I said, well, then, man, you don't have to quit doing nothing to accept Jesus. It's just once you get Jesus in your heart, you're going to find that the Holy Spirit is going to minister to the pain that you've been trying to deal with by smoking marijuana so efficiently that you ain't going to need to do dope anymore. I mean, it ain't the don't do's, it's the get to. Yes, that's what it is. I mean, bless God. It's the concepts of Christ that we got to major on, not all this other stuff. I mean, all the other stuff is important. Sure it is. We all need the other things that come with the religion to give us certain handholds on our own faith. I know that, but I'm just saying that ain't it. It is Jesus. It is the love that he has for us. It is the blood that he shed on the cross. It is that if we had each been the only one who had needed it, he would have still done it. And if he loves me that much and he loves you that much, then the least that we can do for him is to love each other that much. Amen. Concepts of Christ, my, that is a deep subject, Brother Warren King. <laughs> You've been speaking of these concepts, but we know that if you get into explaining them to us, it will take hours, yea, even days. And so I don't know why you've preached the sermon that you have, being unable as you are at this late hour to continue on and tell us the complexities of the concepts of Christ. Well, actually, I don't think that they're all that complex. I don't think that God would do that to us. Because, see, in the Bible, he says that we're sheep. You know why? Sheep are the dumbest animals on the face of the earth. <laughs> they're totally lost without their shepherd. Yeah. And when the shepherd talks, it's going to have to be simple because, you know, all we can say back is, Bleh. 
You take a look at all the world's philosophy. You take a look at all the world's science. You take a look at all the progress that's brought us to where we are. You sum it up into one great big lump and you compare it to with the love of God. You know, it all just says, Bleh. Yeah. Yeah. So God made things simple for us. He said things like, hey, all of the law is summed up in this, that you love me and that you love your neighbor as yourself. That's simple, huh? I guess when you get right down to it, I believe that the concepts of Christ can be summarized in the words of one song. Oh, yeah? What song is that? That's probably one of them great symphonic hymns of the church, isn't it, Brother Warnke? One of those that make the goosebumps chase each another one up and down your spine. One of those great symphonic, orchestrated, intense, complicated songs of the church that only the most exquisite voices and talents are allowed to proclaim the gospel and the truth and joy of God through. That's probably the kind of song you're talking about, ain't it? You know, one of them songs that goes... I come before thy throne of grace and throw myself upon my face. <laughs> I know that I am but a worm. So step on me, God, and watch me squirm. <laughs> In reality, I believe that the concepts of Christ can be summed up in the words of a song that are much simpler and because of the simplicity of the song is much more profound than the one that I just sang. I have two bachelor's degrees and two master's degrees and I'm working on a PhD at Assumption College. I've been an ordained minister since 1975 and all of you should learn to never judge a book by its cover. You see, I'm the way I am out of choice, not because I'm so stupid I don't know any better. And after 35 years of school, I've come to realize that the simplest things on earth are the things that are the most profound. So when it comes to the concepts of Christ and the song that relates them best to me, the song I choose is one that goes like this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And to me, to me, those are the concepts of Christ. I don't know a lot about a lot of theological things, though I have the head knowledge, but thankfully they've not sifted down into my heart yet. I haven't become cold because of divinity. I haven't become stretched out because of theology. I haven't been put in a corner because of philosophy. I still have the grace and ability to love because I know what love can do. I may not know what some of this other stuff can do, but I know what love can do because I used to be a pimp and I used to be a pusher and I used to be a $175 a day heroin addict in 1966. I used to be a Satanist. I have a three inch scar on my wrist where my friends used to cut my arm and bleed my blood into a cup and mix it with wine and drink it four times a year for communion to the devil. And on the same arm that I have the scar, I have a little silver bracelet. It doesn't have my name on it because I know my name. <laughs> what it has instead is a scripture verse. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded 
that neither life nor death nor principalities nor powers nor things past nor things present nor things to come nor life nor death nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know what other things do, but I know what that does. And it blesses me a lot to hear you laugh at my jokes and to see you have a good time because I believe that having a good time is a spiritual thing to do because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. But you see, the thing I really came here to do is to say and do something really simple. I know what it is that Jesus would do if he was standing here. He probably wouldn't turn water into wine. He probably wouldn't stretch forth his hand and heal everybody here. He probably wouldn't walk off the stage and stay four feet off the ground and walk out here and turn around and walk back to impress us. Somehow I think that all he'd do is stretch out his arms and look at each one of you individually as only he could. And I think he'd just say, Oh, I love you. So I say that from him to you. And I say that by him to you. From me and mine, because of him to you. I love you. And it's the most important thing that a Christian can say to anybody. It's the thing that we should say before we say anything else. Give the Lord a round of applause for his love. Give the Lord a round of applause for his love. Give the Lord a round of applause for his love.